Have you ever wondered how much of the health advice you read about online is actually wrong? I did too. So I dove deep into the medical journals and uncovered truths that completely shocked me. That's when I decided I had to get this information out there. In this video, I'll share how I went from helping my clients to becoming a best-selling author in the fitness niche by cutting through the noise and bringing science-backed advice to the forefront. Why did I decide to start writing books? Well, it started from I just wanted to help my clients with whatever problems they came to me with. The problems that they came to me with were things like osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, osteoarthritis, etc. But to help my clients, I needed accurate information. Unfortunately, I couldn't use mainstream information because that's not accurate. I couldn't use regular blogs, videos, TikTok videos, etc. I needed to go straight to the source to the medical journals to analyze the data for myself. Once I dug into the medical journals, I realized how much mainstream information is either completely wrong, partially wrong, or downright harmful. The more I read, the more I thought that this information should really be out there. Why isn't true, good, scientific, effective information getting out there to the masses and actually making a difference? There was just such a significant gap between what I read in mainstream media versus the scientific research. There were so many golden nuggets in the scientific literature that they just weren't getting out to the mainstream. So I decided I had to take matters into my own hands and get this information out. Process of writing forced me to get into the head of my prospective reader and understand what they thought, believed, wanted, and feared, and how to explain it in a way that they understood. It said that you've mastered a subject when you're able to teach it to somebody else. That was my desire behind writing books. I wanted to understand the subject for myself so well I could implement the knowledge with my clients and help them do better. As well, I wanted to get that information out to people who couldn't work with me directly either for financial reasons, distance reasons, etc. So what did I learn from the scientific research? Well, plenty. And all of it is actually in my books, my other videos, my blogs, etc. But let me summarize some of the best golden nuggets in this video. For type 2 diabetics, the discussion over carbohydrates is highly overrated. It's majoring in the minor. Carbohydrates do matter, but not as much as two other factors. The most important thing is actually just total calories. The next most important thing is fiber content. In one study, they did a head-to-head -head comparison of a high-carb diet versus a low-carb diet for diabetes. In this study, the calories between the two groups were identical, but the composition of those calories was different. The high-carb group, 53% of their daily calories came from carbs, and the low-carb group, only 13% of their daily calories came from carbs. At the end of the study, both groups lowered their blood sugar levels by the exact same amount, 1%. That's an A1C of 7.3% down to 6.3%. So no real advantage for carbohydrates in terms of blood sugar levels. There was an advantage for carbohydrates in the sense that less insulin was needed to get their blood sugar down. So it's a very minor, minor effect. So if carbohydrates don't really matter as much as we think they do, what is it that really matters? Well, the failure is not in the discussion of carbohydrates. It's in the lack of distinction between high fiber carbohydrates and low fiber carbohydrates. There is a whole Different, a huge difference between getting, let's say, 300 grams of carbs from beans, peas, lentils, and chickpeas versus spaghetti, bread, potatoes, and rice. They're both carbohydrates, but one has significantly more fiber than the other one. In research where fiber is increased for type 2 diabetics, their uh, blood sugar comes down by 2.5% compared to just 1% when carbohydrates are reduced. So the effects of fiber are far more, po more potent, and the effects of just total calories are even more potent. That's for diabetes. Now, what about osteoporosis? When somebody is diagnosed with osteoporosis, the first three pieces of advice they get are one, take calcium, two, go for a walk, and three, don't fall. These pieces of advice are completely, utterly nonsensical and to some, in some cases harmful. The calcium myth comes from, well, milk commercials. When we were kids, we, we heard commercials of drink milk for strong bones and teeth. Now, how much of a role does calcium really play in bone strength? for people with osteoporosis, we don't really know. But what we do know is that calcium, both dietary and supplemental, does not decrease fractures. And that's been proven in many studies over and over and over. When women with osteoporosis are divided into different groups based on their calcium intake, we see no differences in fractures with, uh, between the lowest calcium groups and the highest calcium groups. What that tells us is that it gives you the illusion of strong bones because it slightly increases bone density but it doesn't do anything to fracture risk, which is what really matters. The second myth is about walking. All walking does is it slows down the rate of bone loss. 
but that's not good because if you have osteoporosis, you already have, you already have weak bones to begin with and you're just continuing to make them get weaker. It's just getting weaker slower. Well, that's not a good standard of care. The next best thing is to maintain, to, to stop the bone loss. But that means you're stopping bone loss at a point when you're already low in bone mass. That's not good either. I prefer to actually increase bone mass and there are better ways of doing that than walking. That's covered in my other videos on your screen right now and in the description below. And the third piece of advice is don't fall. Well, here's the problem with that advice. Falling is not planned. It's not something you put into your calendar. Oh, Tuesday, 10 o'clock, that's a good time for a fall. Falling is unplanned. Better advice would be prevent things that could uh, cause you to fall. In other words, salt your driveways, make sure the path from your bed to the bathroom is clear at night so that you're not tripping over anything and improve your balance. And how to do that again is, is covered in, my, in, in another video on your screen right now and in the description below. So mainstream advice for osteoporosis is god awful and there's much better advice out there. But even strength training, which is excellent for building bone strength, does not build bone strength if you do it wrong. There is a way to strength train in general, then there is a way to strength train specifically for bone strength. And you have to use the right details to improve bone strength. And that's covered in another video on your screen right now and in the description below. For high blood pressure, there are many things you could do to improve it, both nutrition, supplementation, and exercise. But one of the coolest things I've learned from the medical literature is a very simple hand grip exercise that can lower high blood pressure by as much as 15 over 8 millimeters of mercury. And it's just a simple squeeze your hands with about 30% force for two minutes. Then you rest for three minutes and repeat it three more times. Do that three times per week and it's such a simple exercise, doesn't require any equipment, you can do it while watching TV, has a very, very potent effect on high blood pressure, on par with things like cardio and strength training, which have other unique benefits. And there are of course some dietary things you could do to improve your high blood pressure. In fact, one lady who read my book from high, uh, about high blood pressure, she took her blood pressure from emergency high to normal high in a matter of just one week, which is quite, quite impressive without medications. Next, for osteoarthritis, there are seven different kinds of exercise for it, and they are divided based on three parameters. One parameter is speed. How long does it take to see results or pain reduction? Two is the magnitude. By how much does it reduce your pain? And three is durability. Once you stop doing it, how long does it take for the pain to return? And these seven forms of exercise are as follows. Strength training, cardio, foam rolling, stretching, yoga, traction, and proprioceptive exercises. These are the seven and they have different effects, different magnitudes, different durabilities. The two that work the least are stretching and yoga. They have a very, very minor effect. The effect comes on pretty quickly within a matter of hours, but, it, but the effect isn't, the magnitude isn't great and the durability is terrible. The single best exercise when it comes to improving osteoarthritis joint pain is strength training. A, it has a high magnitude, between 45 and 60% pain reduction, as well as a very high durability. Even if you were to stop strength training, which you shouldn't, but if you were, then the effects, the pain reduction effects of strength training last for two to three months beyond that. Nothing else even comes, clo comes close to that durability. The downside of strength training is speed. It does take about eight to 12 weeks to see results, to see pain reductions. As for speed of results, there's a couple of winners here. One is cardio. You can see results uh, in terms of pain reduction in a matter of just, uh, just three or four workouts, which doesn't take very long. But the durability is not great. Once you stop doing cardio within one to three weeks, the effects go away and you're back to square one. Whereas another form of exercise called proprioceptive exercise, which is different ways of moving your body that improves your, your awareness of where your body is in space. The magnitude is actually quite high. It's about 45 to 55%. So almost on par with strength training. The amount of time it takes to do it is not very long, 10 to 20 minutes per day, three to five days per week and the speed of results is also pretty good, just a couple of weeks. So these are the three most potent forms of exercise for osteoarthritis. If you like these golden nuggets, there are three ways we can help you. Method number one, I have a free exercise and nutrition newsletter. You can subscribe to it by just clicking on the link in the description below. Method number two, you can purchase my books on Amazon, which are all linked in the description below. And method number three, the highest touch, the most premium, which is you can apply to see if you qualify for our one-on-one personal training services, no matter where you are in the world. It can be done online. If you click on the link below, it will take you to our homepage where you can fill out a quick, uh, quick application form that will take you to a, uh, to a 10, 15 minute Zoom chat with us. No pressure, no obligation, no sales pitch, just to see whether we can work together. Thank you and goodbye.